Again, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, with a capital I, uh, which was one of the many initiatives that Francisco has led uh, to strengthen the role and profile uh, and impact of the role of the Special Rapporteur and Indigenous Peoples. Uh, Francisco uh, is a lecturer in law and associate director of the IPLP Human Rights Programs. Uh, works very closely uh, with Shauna Howard, who directs our human rights programs, uh, and also with Elisa Marshi, uh, who is uh, the legal advisor for the IPLP external support team uh, for the Special Rapporteur. Uh, and a number of our students are here who get to actually work uh, and learn uh, from our incredible legal staff and faculty and the member, esteemed member of our faculty, Jose Francisco Calizine. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce him as the keynote speaker to this keynote talk on conservation, racism, and indigenous people's human rights symposium. And while he's coming up, I also want to thank Melanie Clerk, uh, who has also worked very closely in helping to organize this conference. So, Francisco. Thank you, Professor. Well, first of all, thank you very much to Professor uh, Rob Williams for the introduction, and of course to uh, the University of Arizona uh, for asking me to be the key speakers today. Uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, dear guest speakers, I want to express my gratitude to the Indigenous People Law and Policy Protected Areas and Conservation Initiative and to the uh, Arizona Journal of Environmental Law and Policy for having organized this important symposium and to the Bay and Paul Foundation and particularly to Rebecca Adamson for their support for, uh, and funding. I also want to thank all the students of the IPLP Conservation Clinic for their hard work in mapping out indigenous people's rights violations in protected areas. And all members of, uh, and volunteers of the Arizona Journal of Environmental Law and Policy for highlighting the critical intersections of indigenous environmental legal rights among our student academic community here in the University of Arizona. I have spent almost all my life fighting against racism, against indigenous peoples, and of course, the violation of their rights. I served for 16 years as a member of the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and this is my fourth year serving as a special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples. I have witnessed and continue to witness on the ground and to various faces the racism and racial discrimination uh, can take. I remember one uh, a speech that one of the high commissioner of human rights uh, gave in the beginning of the, uh, this century. She said, uh, I remember when she said, the fight against racism has been advanced. Unfortunately, racism also has been advanced taking another characteristic, a sophisticated uh, practices. And I added to that a cynic one, because uh, some of my colleagues have been traveling with me, and always when I am getting to the immigration centers, they always said, oh, I'm sorry, but uh, in a random way, we are taking you to reach, to search your, your, your bags. And that is something that always is taking place in, in, in the airports. So that is very, it called my attention because uh, in Sweden, I passed uh, to the same airport the same week three times. And the three times they took me in a random way to search my bags. So I don't know, I think it's a, it's a random way. As you all know, today, 21st of March, marks a very special day. Today is the United Nations International Day on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination because on the 21st of March of 1960, police, police in South Africa opened fire and killed 69 people 
at a peaceful demonstration in Sharpeville against the apartheid past law. The UN General Assembly proclaimed this day in 1966 to commemorate this massacre and to call upon the international community to redouble its effort to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination. And that reminds me also that uh, when uh, the apartheid was ended in South Africa, everybody said the racism also ended. But for indigenous peoples especially, it seems to be that the apartheid is stayed in our territories. Because uh, uh, for indigenous people, nothing, nothing has been changed. Oops, somebody entered to the system. <laughs> It's against me or against uh, this celebration? <laughs> okay, so uh, the thing is that, uh, for, for example, I remember that uh, uh, in my own country, I have two brothers here from Guatemala, they cannot uh, uh, make me to lie to you. I remember that in the 60s, 70s, still in the 70s, beginning of the 80s, the street rows of the buses is take it only for non-indigenous peoples. If you are taking the, 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 we can say, the courage to sit on those three or four seats, they are going to beat you. So that was the, the life that we had been uh, uh, having in Guatemala, and that's why, I, as I remember, I started to fight against the racism in my own land. So for indigenous people, Racial discrimination continues. It's not, racism is not black and white. It's a, a way of thinking of the people because they don't believe that they, all people are equal by law and we are all human beings. So racism in indigenous peoples, the issue of indigenous peoples rights entered the United Nations human rights system in the 70s precisely because of the ongoing and pervasive effect of racism and racial discrimination on indigenous peoples. In August 1970, the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities, by resolution 4B 23 of 26 of August 1970, recommended that a complete and comprehensive study of the problem of discrimination against indigenous peoples be undertaken. The study of the problem of discrimination against indigenous population published in 1984, drafted by a dear friend also from Guatemala. In his memory, I mention his name, Augusto Williamson Diaz, took more than 12 years of work. This pioneering work details in, in 12 chapters the various forms of discrimination experienced by indigenous people in all regions of the world and recommended hundreds of measures and reactions to eliminate discrimination. Unfortunately, this study is, not, is known not as a, a William Sendias study, it's known as a Jose Martinez Cobo study. In 2001, the Declaration and Program of Action World Conference Against Racism, racism Racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance recognize that indigenous people have been victims of discrimination for centuries and affirm that they are free and equal in dignity and rights and should not suffer any discrimination, particularly on the basis of their indigenous origin and identity, and stress the continuing need for action to overcome the persistent racism and racial discrimination xenophobia and related intolerance that affect them. The various impact of, of what I will term structural discrimination or structural racism and institutional racism on indigenous people are reflected in high level of poverty, maternal and infant mortality, low life expectancy, marginalization, social exclusion and limited access to adequate housing, healthcare healthcare, education, employment, and decent working condition, participation and uh, presentation, or to justice and release. In, ad in, in addition, indigenous people continue to face discrimination in the exercise of their rights to own and control their lands and territories. 
the right to consultation and free and private informed consent and self-determination. Racism is a century-old ideology which has survived and consti constitute on its own a barrier to, con to apprehension of indigenous people as equal human beings and to the exercise of their human rights. Discrimination and racism were used to justify colonial invasion and expansion, occupation of indigenous lands and territories, exploitation and domination of indigenous people, and the world-scale destruction of entire indigenous societies. Racism was implicit in many legal doc doctrines, such as the doctrine of discovery, concept of terra nullis, effect effective occupation which were used to justify the invasion of indigenous territories and dispossession of their ancestral lands and territories. Racism justified the civilizing, the civilizing mission of colonial powers and their duty to bring the so-called benefits of Western civilization to uncivilized primitive peoples or inferior race around the world. Racism is behind the contamination of indigenous land, water, and territories by nuclear testing, dumping of toxic waste, pesticides, fumigation, oil spills, dams, and what people have termed environmental racism. Racism is also behind the rejection of the legitimacy of indigenous values, institution, justice system, traditional knowledge, and land management and conservation practices. Indigenous people supposed backwardness and irrationally to manage their land or internal affairs have crystallized as conventional wisdom in the minds of political politicians and members of the judiciary system. Racism and conservation. Racism is behind the eviction of indigenous peoples, the development of national parks and protected areas excluding the original inhabitants of these lands. Today is also the International Day of Forest, proclaimed the day in 12, 2012. The United, Nation, the United Nations General Assembly called on the international community to celebrate and raise awareness of the importance of protecting forests and trees. In, interesting, the word forest originated as a juridical term in early Middle Age in Europe to designate royal game preserved reserved for the king's recreational activities. In Asia and Africa, the first protected area were established as recreational opportunities, hunting grounds for Western colonial elites. The first protected area established in the US, such as Yellow, uh, Nation, Yellowstone National uh, Park of the uh, Yosemite National Park, involved uh, the violent eviction of indigenous people who had been living in this land for thousands of years. Some of the earliest American advocates of, the conser of conservation and protected area, promoting pristine, pristine environment and uh, the fortress conservation approach. Founders of high profile conservation NGOs were also famous proponents of scientific racism, colonial expansion, and eugenics. Uh, and eugenics. Indigenous people were seen as a weak race and were do, do, doomed to disappear in the course of progress in moder and modernity. Conservation colonial uh, underpinning continued to pro portray indigenous people as responsible for conservation problems and permit practices that forcibly evict indigenous people from their ancestral lands and prevent them from practicing hunting fishing, or grazing their animals, accessing sacred sites, collecting wood, often by extreme violence and militarized means. In many countries, national law and forest conservation or protected areas have the effect of nullifying the rights of indigenous people to their lands and territories, as well as the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise on an equal footing of their right, human rights and fundamental freedom in the political, economical, social, cultural, or any other field 
of public life as defined under Article 1 of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It is now time to acknowledge and come to, to terms with the Western conservation deep-seated systemic racism which has historically excluded indigenous people and continue to do so. Parad paradigm shift. With this conf uh, confrontation of enduring realities, it is also time to operate a paradigm shift as a conservation is about to become one of the main industries, destroying indigenous people's lives and violating their human rights. This paradigm shift ha was already announced by the world leading conservationist and the International Union for Conservation of Nature World Conservation Congress held in, in, in Durban in 2003, where the 2003 Durban Action Plan was adopted. In this regard, Target 8 and 9 required all existing and future protected areas are managed and established in full compliance with the right of indigenous peoples and have representatives chosen by indigenous peoples and their management pro proportionate to their right and interest. Finally, Target 10 requires the adoption of participatory mechanisms for the restitution of indigenous peoples, traditional land, and territories that were incorporated in protected areas without their free, prior, and informed consent, uh, so established and implemented by 2010. 21 years after such announcement, where, where are we? Conservation institutions and policies continue to exclude and discriminate against indigenous peoples. In the name of protecting nature, protected areas, and national parks continue to be established on the land of indigenous people without their consent, in violation of the right to land, nature resources, and self-determination. Indigenous peoples continue to be forcibly removed from their lands with devastating consequences. The colonial and discriminatory fortress conservation model continue to prevail and to be duplicated in conservation initiatives in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Human rights violation and conservation. The various consequences indigenous people have faced in the wake of ever more expanding protected areas have been raised by many UN Special Rapporteur and the treaty bodies. In the past 14 years, a special procedures mandate holders sent more than 50 communication to express concerns about rights violation of indigenous peoples in protected areas to the government of Sweden, Uganda, United Republic of Tanzania, Ecuador, Malaysia, Thailand, Nepal, Honduras, China, Guatemala, India, Chile, Kenya, Bolivia, Botswana, Namibia, Canada, and Indonesia. Just talking about some of them. During the same period, the undertook country visits observed and underlying conservation related human rights violations of indigenous peoples perpetrated in Costa Rica, Republic of Congo, Ecuador, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Paraguay, Namibia, Argentina, Kenya, New Zealand, Russia Federation, Botswana, Mongolia, Uruguay, Cameroon, and Rwanda. In the meantime, the treaty bodies, in particular the Human Rights Committee, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, have also expressed concern about rights violation of indigenous peoples in the protected areas in Mongolia, Colombia, Rwanda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Bolivia, Ecuador, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, Botswana, Uganda, Kenya, and under its early warning, urgent action, and follow-up procedures, third considered human rights violation of indigenous peoples affected by protected areas and conservation measures in Peru, Sweden, Chile, Brazil, Kenya, Tanzania, and Thailand. As a UN Special Rapporteur on the Right of Indigenous Peoples, I have witnessed myself during file, uh, field visit the destruction the destructive impact of conservation pro, uh, project on indigenous peoples and their 
land, including violent eviction, destruction of their houses and traditional subsistence economy, expropriation of land, denial of self-governance, and indigenous people can no longer hunt, fish, graze their cattle. They lose access to their relig uh, religious, sacred, and cultural sites. They are denied access to justice and reparation, including restitution and compensation. Indigenous people are often forced to relocate it without any resettlement program or access to adequate housing, essential services, water, food, health care, or education. The trauma experienced by indigenous peoples, in particular children, women, and elders who are forcibly evicted from their lands and home creates severe transgenerational post-traumatic stress disorder. Often eviction are accompanied by extreme violence and self-human rights abuses perpetrated by rangers, police officers, and army officials, including torture and ill treatment, arbitrary arrest and detention, unfair trial, extrajudicial killing, summary execution, enforced disappearance, sexual gender-based violence, death threats, etc. Of the 1733 environmental and land defenders killed because of their work between 12, uh, 2012 and 2022, more than a third were from indigenous peoples and other traditional forest dwellers. Indigenous people who constituted less, less than 5% of the global, uh, total global population constituted about 33% of the total defenders killed, exposed, and disproportionate targeting. Beyond this horrific human, human tool, or toll, this model of fortress conservation undermined the very, uh, very, very goals of conservation. The case of experience with fortress conservation contradicts the argument that uh, the removal of indigenous people is necessary for the conservation and or resta uh, restoration of biodiversity. Mountain, mountain study, the studies have shown that indigenous people possess the knowledge and ability necessary to su su successfully conserve and manage biodiverse ecosystem more effectively than governments or conservation organizations, and at a, a fraction of the cost, particularly, particularly where their rights are recognized, respected, and supported. The fortress conservation model diminished rather than enhanced local livelihoods and biodiversity. The loss of the guardianship of indigenous people often leaves areas exposed to poaching, narco-traffic, large-scale tourism, extractive industry, illegal logging and mining, and other forms of degradation and direct conflict with conservation goals. Indigenous ancestral territories encompass about 22% of the world's land surface that hold 80% of the planet's biodiversity. The ancestral lands of indigenous people contain the most intact ecosystem. Wildlife is abundant on indigenous land, but not because such areas are left undertouched, but precisely because indigenous people have been occupied in conserving such land for centuries. As, as we all know, we are facing a global loss of biological diversity on a scale unprecedented in the entire human history. According to the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Ser Services, about 25% of the species in assisted animal and plant groups are threatened unless action is taken. In December 2022, UN member states have endorsed the goal of protecting and conserving 30% of the planet's land and water by 2030 in the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework of the COP15, also known as 30 by 30. The framework acknowledged the important role and contribution of indigenous people as custodian of biodiversity as our partners in its conservation, restoration, and sustainable use. It is also stated implementation must be ensure the right 
knowledge, including traditional knowledge associated with biodiversity, innovation, worldviews, values and practices of indigenous people are respected and documented and preserved with their free prior and informed consent, including through their full and effective participation in decision making, in accordance with relevant national legislation, international instruments, including the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and Human Rights Law. Despite this language, I remain extremely concerned by the potential negative impact of this 30 by 30 conservation project, given that some 15.7% of the world lands currently covered by protected area to reach 30% will require a doubling of the area under some of the conservation protection. My predecessor and myself have formulated a large number of recommendations in 2016 and 2022 in our two thematic report to the General Assembly on the issue of indigenous people's rights, conservation and protected areas. In addition, the current and former special rapporteur in the, in, on the environment, John Knox and David Boyd have also formulated recommendations to protect human rights of indigenous peoples. Other human rights mechanisms, including the treaty bodies, the Human Rights Council, the Universal Periodic Review Working Group, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, as well as the regional human rights bodies, have also formulated recommendations to protect the human rights of indigenous people affected by conservation and protected areas. International human rights standards. The, the concluding observation and jurisprudence adopted by the Human Rights Committee, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in relation to human rights violations related to conservation and protection measures have consistently reminding, reminded state parties of their obligation to protect the human rights of indigenous peoples affected by conservation and protected areas, and notably call upon state parties to protect the right of indigenous peoples' right to equal, uh, equality, to equality and non-discrimination and enjoyment of their human rights, recognize their right to free prior and informed consent, include indigenous peoples in the management of protected areas, guaranteeing access to their land and natural resources, ensure that they can continue fishing, grazing, and hunting on their lands, recognize the right to ownership, control, and conserve their lands, halt forced eviction, provide redress and return to the land from which they were evicted, protected indigenous people from violence to guarantee their physical and mental integrity. Landmark decisions on human rights violations of indigenous people in relation to conservation were adopted by the African Commission on Human Rights and People's Rights, the African Court on Human and People's Rights, or the Inter-American Commission on the Human Rights, calling upon governments to protect and recognize the collective property right of land and protected areas, the endorized Ogiek indigenous peoples in Kenya, Kalinya and Lokono peoples in Suriname, Shakmok Hasek indigenous communities in Paraguay, or the Garifuna in Honduras. This legal development supports the conclusion that failure to respect indigenous people's rights can affect the legitimacy and continuation, and continuation of a large number of protected area national park or conservation projects. I take this opportunity con to congratulate uh, Professor John Knox the first former special rapporteur on human rights and the environment for having taken the initiative with the United Nations Environment Program and to develop draft human rights principle for conservation organization and funders. Mr. Knox will be with us this afternoon. I share his view regarding the urgent need to establish clear, coherent, and consistent human rights guidance for both conservation organizations and major funders of conservation. A number of influential conservation organizations or conservation, and conservation funders have no policy on the rights of indigenous peoples. Others have adopted a standard or policy statement which represent an important step forward in reconciling conservation and indigenous people's rights. 
However, many of these policies or guidelines present substantial weakness and gaps are outdated or do not reflect the current human rights standards and jurisprudence as it applied to indigenous peoples. Often, they are not backed up by monitoring or implementing mechanism. Conservation funders also need to ensure that their support does not inadvertently contribute to human rights abuses and that recipients and their funding adopt and implement, and implement human rights uh, protection in relation to conservation. I also welcome the, uh, and congratulate committee chairman Raul M. Grijalva and Bruce Westerman for having endorsed the HR 7025 Advancing Human Rights uh, Center International Conservation Act on 2022, which will represent a major shift in the U.S. funding of conservation project. Ruben Reyes, District Director, Representative uh, Raul Grijalva, U.S. House of Representatives, is here with us this morning to give us an, an, an update about this bill. I call for its rapid adoption. Call for action. On, that, uh, on, on this special day, I call the international community, including a state, UN agencies, including UNESCO, conservation NGOs, and particularly the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Worldwide Fund for Nature Cooperation Agencies, and particularly the United States agencies, Agency for International Development, and the German Development Cooperation and other public and private donors and stakeholders to join their effort to eradicate racism and racial discrimination and conservation embodied by the fortress conservation model, which continue to devastate the lives of millions of indigenous people in Asia, especially in India and Indonesia, Africa, with particularly mention to the situation in Tanzania and Kenya, and also all Latin America. I call upon donors, investors, and funders to adopt explicit policy and guidelines for the rights of indigenous people that are aligned with international human rights standards, including the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention 1989, uh, ILO Convention, as, as we know all, uh, ILO Convention number 169 and the guiding principle on business and human rights in recent development and jurisprudence. I call upon them to condi condition funding on the adoption and application of a solid indigenous human rights-based approach by the recipient prohibiting funding to projects resulting in the forced resettlement, resettlement of indigenous people or forced extinction of access to traditional and customary resources and prohibit funding to, proje to projects developed without the free prior and informed consent of indigenous people and which will restrict their access to livelihood of their lands. I urge uh, a conservation organization to demonstrate a genuine commitment to a human rights based approach to conservation and the eradication of racism and racial discrimination and in conservation. Indigenous people should be recognized as equal partner rights holders in conservation effort undertaken on their lands and territories, ensuring respect for the rights of indigenous people rather than excluding them from their lands in the same of conservation will ultimately benefit the planet and its people as a whole. I call upon conservation donors, including cooperation agencies, to direct financial flows to support indigenous people to develop and sustain their own conservation initiatives. Indigenous people should be acknowledged as key and equal partners in protecting and restoring nature and recognizing for their conservation contribution. Indigenous knowledges and sustainable nature governance practice must be placed at the forefront of effort to identify designate and manage new and existing areas important for cultural and biological diversity, including indigenous protected and cons conserved areas and other indigenous effort to protect biodiversity as such as indigenous and community conserved areas. These are forest and biodiversity conservation program designed, developed, and led by those who have known, occupied, and protected this forest for thousands of years. To conclude, 
human right-based conservation is the most effective, efficient, and equitable path forward to safeguarding biodiversity. The protection of the ecological integrity of critical ecosystem and positive conservation outcomes are strongly correlated with community-based management that engage indigenous peoples and recognize their human rights, including their right to self-determination, free and prior and informed consent, ownership, and asset and ancestral land, water, territories, and other natural resources. Thank you very much. <laughs>